Okay, perfect. So today, for the most part, I just want to touch briefly upon some internet trends which has um, um, evolved over the last decade or so. Um, briefly touch upon what is this content delivery network? How do they work? Um, and what's the use of a CDN? How how are they going to help your site? And finally, I just want to again talk to you about if you want to set up a content delivery network um, and, and start delivering content for your site over a CDN, how do you go about it? What are the different options available today? And how do you go about evaluating them if you have more than a single choice? So <clears throat> quickly, you know, um, we've known that the internet has changed over the years. But to put that into perspective of folks who are creating content and maintaining sites, um, you know, we can we can take a look at it in terms of what's really changed and fundamentally what's different today. So if you look at um, how the internet or how the web operated a decade ago, uh, there was HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You um, put out simple websites. It was primarily delivered to your desktop because that was a device which was most popular form factor. And um, your networks were pretty much uh, fixed lines. Um, mobile internet penetration wasn't uh, prevalent and even uh, in pockets where they were, it was not used as a primary mechanism to consume content. But you know, even as uh, you know, later 2018, which was a couple of years ago, internet had changed significantly. There were a whole bunch of devices um, that you could use to consume content. Um, there were different operating systems, browsers. Um, to complicate matters further, there were different networks. Now, fixed line networks and mobile networks behave very differently. I think we've uh, had a geo revolution, which has sort of um, brought about good changes. It's made the mobile internet very uh, accessible to a lot of Indians. And today, we consume content over mobile without you know, thinking too much about it. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at what's changed on the tech stack, a lot has changed. Um, you're able to access using the web stack, uh, touch and uh, touch input. Um, Zoom pretty much works on the web stack today. Uh, there's you know uh, a lot of improvements in the way CSS, JavaScript, and some of the other technology work. And users also sort of expect a richer quality of content to be delivered on both mobile and desktop. Your screen sizes have increased. You cannot deliver the same kind of images on your content websites anymore. To put that into perspective, if you look at how you know the internet, the, the web pages on the internet have evolved. Um, you know, back in um, 2011, um, if you look at the size of websites, because of how they were made and how they were delivered, they were fairly small. And today, a median size of a web page delivered on a desktop is about 2 MB, and that's a lot of content to be delivered. And if you look at uh, the mobile pages, it's not too far behind. The median size is about 1.8 MB, and that's fairly large. Um, so it also, Satesh, so you're saying that this is this is a number includes all media, or uh, uh, is there anything that it excludes? It, it actually includes just the pages. That, so that's your HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and images. That's right. and you know uh, everything that goes into Building out the page fonts um, and um, and in some cases audio and video as well. So this um, data set actually is um, I, I picked this up from uh, Web Archive. Um, they've sampled about five million um, websites. They're currently sampling about five million websites across the internet, and uh, it's a constantly growing database. They also use the Chrome User Experience um, report to sort of put out some of these trends and, and uh, data points. I'll, I'll um, you know, talk about uh, how you can use some of these data sets to figure out your content strategy in, uh, uh, in later part of uh, the talk. Um, now, if you look at content sites, um, they're not too far behind. In fact, the content-specific sites actually have more content in, in the sense that they are heavier than your median pages. Uh, content Content specific pages can um, have content of about 7.4 MB. And, and that's a lot of content, a lot of information, 
um, which which gets delivered to end users. And this is primarily because the expectations have changed. You want high quality videos, high quality images to be delivered. A lot of people, you know, even if they're in pockets, have increasingly higher screen resolutions, retina display or large form factors. And irrespective of how, you know, your users consume the content, you want the experience to be consistent. And essentially what that <clears throat> does is as content owners or content creators, we're creating content which is heavier. And, you know, that's, that's sort of the expectation. But on the flip side, um, if you look at some of the statistics, um, um, or even, you know, as a consequence of this increase in uh, content size, your pages start to sort of degrade. Now, the expectation is internet is fast today, so even if I deliver seven megs on, um, you know, a single page, it should get delivered fast. But that's, um, that's you know, a very small fraction of users who are on high quality internet or they have really good mobile connectivity. For a majority of people, internet is average. And um, you want to ensure that your pages load consistently irrespective of how good or bad the internet is. That's one aspect of it. And if you look at some studies, right, uh, these studies are put out by different organizations. I think Chrome has, um, uh, or Google has put out a study which says that if your page uh, load increases, your page load time increases from one to three seconds, you're likely to see a 32% reduction in or increase in the bounce rate. Um, basically, I think a lot of these studies, what they're trying to say is faster pages are good. If your page is slow, people are not likely to be, you know, wanting to stay on till your page loads or they're just going to move on. And that puts a lot of pressure as a consequence of that, you want to make your pages faster um, and, and you see this all around. Uh, SEO rankings are based on how quickly your page loads. Um, even, you know, uh, for example, if you're dealing with videos, if your video is buffering, users complain, and uh, with, with the social media penetration today, it's, it's fairly common for complaints to reach a doorstep pretty quickly. So <clears throat> given all of that, um, there is a lot of pressure on content creators, people who are building out and, and you know, maintaining these sites to be very efficient in delivering the content. And, um, you know, there are many ways to improve the performance of the site. Uh, I think in the last session, you spoke about web performance, how, uh, you know, developers can focus on optimizing, uh, you know, the websites or the web pages. Now, outside of those optimizations, there are, you know, some other things uh, uh, content creators can do, that is, leverage infrastructure which specializes or will aid you in improving the performance of your site. Now, I always, uh, you know, um, I, I, when I talk about uh, content delivery networks, now content delivery networks are that special infrastructure or uh, these are networks or um, um, service providers which help you deliver content, improve performance of your website. So a good way to get sort of get started on the concept of a CDN is, um, you know, to think of the e-commerce problem today. Now, um, instead of looking at this as, um, you know, some, some server with a lot of people, if you reimagine this as your Amazon e-commerce, uh, you know, problem, think of Amazon having one central warehouse in India, put it anywhere in Mumbai, Bangalore, or one of the big cities, and you have people from across the country placing orders. Now, if Amazon had just one warehouse, all of those orders would go to that one warehouse and it has to cater to all of these, uh, you know, orders that are coming in. And um, the other thing is, you know, you might place the order from Kanyakumari and if your warehouse is in Mumbai, it's, it's further away. So uh, that's a logistical problem. And the way you would go about dealing with this problem on, um, an e-commerce or a logistic use case is, uh, you know, set up warehouses in tier two, tier three cities, or even other tier one cities, and stock up the items and deliver the items from there whenever an order comes in. So when the order comes in, they'll figure out, okay, you know, I placed an order for probably a non-perishable item. If it's there, you know, deliver it. That's how you get your one-day delivery or same-day delivery. So we've seen that working really well in day-to-day uh, -day lives. I always uh, tend to use my one-day delivery. It's, it's always good when things come home faster. And 
the same concept actually applies to your content delivery network as well. Now, over the internet, you are, you are running your web server either in a cloud or data center, and um, it, it, it doesn't matter if it's a web server or you know just a, a system that delivers uh, uh, static content, like for example, some some storage system. Um, you will be, um, you know, uh, in, in the simplest uh, uh, format, you're going to be delivering a lot of this content directly to your end users. So, uh, you know, I, I, and all of these requests will go back to your server. Now, we can um, take the Hasgeek example. Um, I spoke to Zainab, asked uh, Zainab if I can use uh, the Hasgeek site as an example. Now, based on what I could find, Hasgeek does not use a CDN today. And um, it's it's hosted out of any GUI network data center. So when all of us, you know, go to submit proposals or uh, come to you know see what sessions are there uh, on Haskeek next week, we are actually making a request to that web server in um, E2E Cloud. All of those requests go to E2E Cloud, and that looks somewhat like this. And this is users from across the country. Now, if Haskeek was to use a content delivery network. Now, by um, a lot of content delivery network have multiple points of presence, and, and this is true across the board. Um, what they essentially do is uh, they bring content closer to the end user, and by virtue of content being closer and a couple of other things, it sort of improves the performance of you know uh, your website for end users. So. In this case, if uh, Haskeek were to use a CDN, um, all of the content would be served, or some of the content would be served from these uh, points of presence, and that would speed up the site. So, <clears throat> you know, we spoke about what a CDN does. It's a it's a delivery network that focuses on bringing content closer to you, and delivering content from there. But why is that important? Why should you use a CDN? Now, for starters, I think. It does a few things straight off the bat. It ensures that uh, your site loads quickly. Um, again, um, you know, because uh, they, they're specialized uh, infrastructures or platforms, um, they ensure that your site is available all the time. And I'll get back to you know this this point in in just a bit. Also on the internet today, there are a lot of malicious. Um, uh, Requests. There are a lot of hackers who are trying to exploit vulnerabilities in your site, either to gain access to uh, accounts that don't belong to them, or just bringing down infrastructures. Um, that falls in the category of application layer malicious requests or DDoS attacks. Again, you want to use a CDN as one of the mechanisms to sort of protect your sites or uh, systems against this class of an attack. So. Um, um, you know, um, that, that that gives us a good understanding of what are the different use cases of CDNs and um, how they are useful to you. But CDNs have actually changed over, you know, the last decade or so. Similar to how the web has changed, CDNs have sort of had to keep up with, um, you know, the changing demands. Um, initially, or, you know, uh, back in late 90s or early 2000s, CDNs primarily delivered static content. So you would, you know, if, if all of your site was being delivered on hasgeek.com, you had a couple of other uh, domains, images.hasgeek.com or static.hasgeek.co.in. Those are actual domains that Hasgeek uses. Um, you know, back in the day, you would simply say that, okay, I can use a CDN to deliver images. I can use, um, you know, a CDN to deliver static content. That should improve the overall uh, user experience for my users. Um, that was true, um, but over the years, I think the CDNs have uh, changed strategy. Um, they can actually now serve dynamic content. Basically, they uh, proxy all your dynamic content. If it's not cacheable, it goes back to your uh, web server. The content is fetched and delivered to the end user. Um, and there is an inherent improvement in performance by doing that. And I'll quickly touch upon why there is an improvement in performance. And uh, CDNs today actually do a lot more. Uh, they can actually transform your pages, improve um, or you know uh, compress your images on the fly, uh, provide a lot more in security in terms of bot management or uh, protection against uh, 
um, <clears throat> script injection and uh, uh, other sorts of attacks that you usually um, see on the internet. Different CDN vendors have different capabilities. I'll not speak about specific capabilities, but I'll touch upon large themes. Uh, Satya, now, in the in the in the last slide, could you because we are talking about uh, people who uh, would be fairly new to this uh, or or people who have not uh, gone so much deep into the technology. So could you sh explain the the now bit where how does it work with because we have known CDN to be something that takes dumb static content and simply serve it. Uh, yeah. But dynamic content, how does that bit work? Uh, you talk something about proxying and going back to the origin. If you can spend a, a few minutes just explaining how that works, that would be great. OK, perfect. That's actually my next slide, right? Um, All right. You know, okay. um, I, I would, so if you ask about how static content is delivered, that's in fact you know, um, what, what I've uh, put up on the on the screen uh, right here. This is actually without a CDN. So today, um, again, using Haskeek as a reference, um, we'll make a few assumptions for um, this conversation. We'll assume that Haskeek, all the HTML pages are indeed dynamic because, um, and, and you know, th there can be a situation where it's a marketing site, so uh, the HTML page is, is also static. And just to clarify, um, when I'm, when I talk about static content, um, I'm not specifically talking about CSS, JavaScript, uh, or images. Basically, static content is something that does not change, either because uh, you know there is a difference between who's accessing it or where the request is coming in from. Like for example, if you and I go to the Haskeek page and it's the exact same site that's delivered, the exact same HTML snippet that comes down, and that HTML snippet is static. Um, a dynamic yeah. HTML would be when you log in. Um, you're an editor on Haskeek, so you would have additional dashboards um, and, and um, you know fancy charts and comments and uh, other features. Um, so that is um, not available to me when I log in. And that makes that uh, particular HTML snippet dynamic. So, uh, so and, and there can be more factors as well, right? So anything that, where, where, as you said, changing content or versus everyone getting the same content, that should be the qualifying factor and not just logging in. So even yeah. if you have something like uh, uh, a different content being delivered to say people coming in from different geographies, as an example, or different yeah. content being delivered to different devices, types of devices, uh, then that also qualifies. Am I right? Yes. Yes, it does. In in the simplest terms, it does. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, I'll just uh, set some context. Um, a lot of uh, general purpose CDNs are able to sort of uh, cache content based on where the uh, end users are coming in from. Like, for example, if you have two pages, one for India and one for the rest of the world, and both of them don't change, but the URL is still the same. Like, for example, Haskeek has a homepage. Uh, it shows, um, you know, different content when people from outside of India visit, and it shows, um, you know, the content that we see on Haskeek today when when everyone from India logs in. It's still considered static. It's just treated a little differently because fundamentally, it's not changing with individuals. We can uh, still leverage the benefits of caching because you don't have to make, um, you know, personal decisions. So, I would still use the personal um, uh, differentiation of content as a qualifier for static. But that you know gets uh, into some nuances. Uh, to keep it simple, in this conversation, we'll, we'll make the assumption that if the content changes at all, uh, we'll treat it as dynamic, but otherwise it's static. OK, so in this um, uh, workflow, we'll talk about what happens when dynamic content is requested from the Haskeek servers today. So when I go ahead and make a request for haskeek.com, um, essentially what happens on my browser? First, the browser makes a request to DNS. Um, there is an IP uh, uh, that's returned from the DNS resolution. And my browser goes ahead and makes a GET request on haskeek.com uh, to um, um, index.html, and, and that's what is returned and, and displayed on my browser. Now, if you use a CDN, um, there are a few things that happen. Um, slightly differently. 
for starters and i'll talk about this in a little more detail in in one of the later slides but when you when an end user makes a request uh, and if your site is using a cdn you're most likely again um, i'm taking a use case which is common for most cdn use cases there are exceptions um, in most cases what uh, your site is going to be pointing to is a cname dns record now what that means is uh, typically when when you have a dns record um, it's pointing to an a record which is directly an ipv4 or an ipv6 record uh, <clears throat> But when you're using a CDN, in most cases, you're pointing to a CNAME record. And the reason for that is a, a CDN has to figure out what is the nearest location to that particular end user and, and send you the IP address for that particular end user. Or, you know, uh, in, in uh, different strategies, either the IP is different or based on, um, uh, for example, you know, uh, you would you would uh, send one set of IPs for all of um, the users using a CDN from India. If they are using it from some other location, let's say Singapore or Australia, they would send you a different location. But the concept is um, pretty similar. There is a CNAME record. That CNAME record eventually gets resolved to an uh, to an IP address, and your browser still makes a request for an IP address. And uh, this time, it actually makes a request to the CDN. Now, I'd mentioned that uh, you know in the past or in early CDN days, CDN could only handle static content. But today, almost all CDNs are fairly intelligent. They're rule-based uh, in the sense when a request comes in, they are able to identify using some qualifiers. In this case, uh, you could say that HTML pages are all dynamic. So uh, the CDN would say, OK, fine, this is an HTML page. Uh, it's dynamic, so I cannot return uh, this response, or you know, I cannot cater to this request from cache. So let me go ahead to the Haskeek server, fetch that home page, and then return it back to the end user. And that's essentially what happens. Now in this workflow, um, you know, if you if you look at this, um, I've mentioned that CDNs have uh, multiple points of presence, and uh, that's one of the reasons for CNAME record is used. And uh, you're always uh, pointing or you always request content from a CDN location that's closer to you. Now, <clears throat> what that um, means is uh, it's going to give you performance benefits, like the e-commerce use case that we spoke about, that nearest CDN location is, you know, uh, in network uh, terms, much closer to you than uh, the Haskeek web server, which is running Nginx in E2E networks. And by virtue of that, the time it takes for a request uh, from my browser on my Wi-Fi to go to the, the CDN location is lower than the time it takes for uh, me to go directly to the web server. And <clears throat> it boils down to some key metrics. Uh, in this case, it, it boils down to round trip times. And uh, uh, almost all of the internet is uh, running HTTPS these days. So, it boils down to the time it takes for a TLS connection to be set up. And almost all CDNs use some form of TCP optimizations. Uh, they also reuse this connection. So um, in, in the previous slide, uh, I was talking to you about how a CDN would go back to the origin uh, server or your web server and then fetch uh, the homepage from haskeek.com. Now, that CDN um, location has already set up this uh, TCP connection to, to make a request. Now, when I first make the request, if this TCP connection wasn't set up, uh, you know, uh, the, the CDN would, would initiate a connection, respond to that request. Subsequently, if you go ahead and, you know, make the same request and you, you <clears throat> land up on the same CDN location, what happens is, that connection is still open, so there is no time lost in establishing that connection. You're quickly able to, you know, fetch that content and and serve the end user. So um, that improves um, the performance, and and that's for dynamic content. It's it's no longer static content. Now, similarly, um, uh, it it also matters where you are. Now, we explained that CDNs have multiple locations. Let's actually quantify that, right? Um, again, I've, I've used some simulations to sort of 
um, demonstrate or uh, it's 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 a little bit of a stretch. It it may not be the best way to measure this, but it will give you an idea of why you need to serve content from closer to end users. Though it makes sense intuitively, we can look at some metrics and see how that plays out. So, again, um, to to sort of uh, go over why content should be closer, uh, what I did was run a quick trace route from uh, my laptop uh, to Haskell server. It takes about 45 milliseconds, uh, and and that's really really good. Um, Haskell site loads up, I think, under two seconds on my laptop, um, and uh, that's actually a very good experience. But um, Haskey um, also caters to users across the country. Um, I use ACT broadband, as you can see. Um, um, other people who are going to the Haskey site may not use ACT. They might be on uh, Geo. Uh, sorry to interrupt. For the benefit of the users, can you explain what is Traceroute? Yes. So For the audience. Yeah. Sure. So um, what I've uh, what I've done is uh, yesterday I was putting these uh, slides together and I wanted to understand, okay, where is uh, the Haskell server? I know it's on E2E network, um, but you know, how far is it? Is it in India? Is it, you know, uh, is it very far away in terms of network hops? Um, again, even though, uh, you know, I can have uh, a, a web server in Bangalore, uh, physically it's, it's very close, but in terms of network, it'll, it could actually be pretty far away. And that boils down to what ISP you're on, or in this case, what ISP I have in my house. What is the ISP connection that the Haskell server has? And what's the best route between uh, my house to the Haskell server? And one of the ways to figure out uh, when you make a request, um, how it actually traverses the internet and goes to its destination, um, there are uh, basic tools available. It's available on Windows and uh, Linux and Mac. Uh, that's called trace route. Uh, I think the command differs from Windows and Mac. Uh, on Mac, it's just trace route. Uh, and you just enter either an IP address or uh, the domain. And it eventually resolves to the IP address and tries and figures out, OK, like for from my Wi-Fi connection to the Haskell server, what are the different hops? How how long does it take? And and you know uh, what are some other bottlenecks? Here you can see that you know I, I have a Wi-Fi set up, um, so that's uh, that's my Wi-Fi IP. Um, ACT gives me dynamic IP, so uh, having my IP on uh, uh, published is is not an issue. I think every time uh, the router resets, I get a different IP. I actually check that. Um, and finally, uh, you know, there are these different hops uh, between, um, you know, ACT broadband to the Haskell server. And these are essentially for all, uh, you know, these are essentially network elements or routers which route the traffic. And all of that actually adds to the latency. If Haskell server was closer, like for example, if Haskell server was deployed on ACT broadband, um, it, uh, you know, the, the trace routes would probably stop right here in, in the sixth row. And right. um, if you add all the times up, it, it could be in the order of 30 milliseconds or um, probably lower than that. Right. And um, that's that's a factor of distance. Now, to sort of quantify this, um, what I did was I used web page test. Now, web page test is, is a tool. I think uh, you spoke about it last time. Everyone yeah. um, is fairly familiar with it. And I ran. Uh, a web page test from different locations. I took Mumbai, Singapore, uh, LA, and London. And I just wanted to see what happens if end users are coming to Haskey from all of these different locations. Now, you can take any metric you want uh, that, uh, you know, depending on what you're trying to measure, you might want to look at just DOM complete or fully loaded. But for this discussion, let's use DOM complete. DOM complete is basically when all the resources are um, pretty much delivered to the browser, at least on the Haskell site. There's nothing that loads beyond DOM, DOM complete. And um, if you look at DOM complete, uh, from Mumbai, it's about three seconds. That means it takes three seconds for the entire uh, resources to be delivered to your browser. And after that, it's, it's painting and executing some background scripts and making some analytics calls. Um, from Singapore, it's roughly the same. It's in fact much faster. So um, Haskell servers are more accessible from AWS Singapore than AWS Mumbai. But 
I'll get to why you shouldn't take some of these metrics at face value. I'll, I'll touch upon that briefly, um, but it gives you a good idea. If you go to LA or London, uh, you'll see something uh, strange happening. From LA, um, the, the time it takes for DOM complete is about six seconds, and London is seven seconds. Now that's a little counterintuitive, but you know, um, internet is strange. So what it, what it tells you is um, if users are in India, Singapore, um, for them, the site loads pretty fast. Um, and, and that's already, uh, you know, significantly different from um, uh, the experience I had when I measured it on my local system, uh, DOM complete was quicker than three seconds. Um, so there is already a little bit of a trend that um, what you can take out of, uh, you know, this uh, data point is performance varies and, and it varies significantly when location varies. Yeah. You can also, um, I went ahead and just did a quick breakdown of the content on Haskeek site. It's got a lot of images, a lot of scripts. Scripts actually constitute a, a bulk of uh, the traffic. And the page, the home page at least, uh, is about 1.2 megs. Now, if you look at the median for websites, Haskeek homepage is actually lower than the median, so it's, it's great. Um, and still takes about three seconds to load. There are a bunch of things we can do to optimize that. Uh, and um, about, and, and you know, if you go to web page test and, and see what are some of the optimizations that you can do, straight off the bat, if you do an image analysis, you'll see that 96% of um, images can be compressed. By size, you'll get uh, a benefit of 96% offload uh, or, or uh, improvement. Uh, what that means is if all of the images were um, compressed and delivered in an optimal format and uh, it was compressed for the optimal quality, um, that number 417 kilobytes can go down significantly. Uh, scripts, you tend to see most benefit in just compression and uh, the same thing goes for CSS. I think 42 kilobytes is, is pretty conservative. Um, scripts, um, I, I think in most cases it's it's already compressed, so um, we'll not try and look at additional optimizations here. Images, yes. And um, if we were to put a CDN in front of Haskeek uh, in, in this scenario, you can look at performance optimizations which will come in from you know, having a CDN which is delivering all of these images, first of all, closer to the end user, from a location that's closer to the end user. And that will remove some of the variability. And, and it, it sort of stems from uh, some of these metrics that uh, or some of these numbers that you see here, right? If you look at uh, the content breakdown, images, CSS, and JavaScript constitute a bulk of uh, the content. Um, we wanted to experiment and we categorized all HTML content as dynamic content. So 17 kilobytes of about 1.2 megs is actually dynamic. Everything else at least is static for the most part. And, it's, uh, and images, CSS, and JavaScript, it's static uh, for almost all use cases. So you can definitely leverage a CDN at least for this section. And if you go back to the numbers, right, there is a lot of variation in 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 um, uh, in the DOM complete time when location varies. If all of these assets were served from uh, you know location which is very close, you would not see that significant difference. You will see some difference because we still have this HTML page which is dynamic. You still have to come back to uh, you know the Haskeek server, but that's just you know about seven requests out of a total of 55. So that will vastly improve the variance in um, you know performance each uh, end user sees when they come to the Haskeek server. So that's an improvement. Okay, um, what are the other things the CDN can give? Uh, and, and when we were talking about uh, uh, capabilities of CDN, we definitely said it adds to your reliability and, and you know it makes sure uh, that uh, your sites are always available. Um, what does that really mean? Because uh, all of us have redundancies built into our cloud or our data center. We have, you know, monitoring for our web server. If it goes down, uh, we know that, uh, you know, there'll be an alert triggered, there'll be a restart script. Or if it yeah. runs over capacity, there's auto scaling in place. So why should, you know, we worry too much about 
uh, reliability and availability. That's that's already a given. Um, it's true uh, for the most part, except when things go horribly wrong. Like for example, you know, you can you can take uh, any variation of this. Let's say you're running uh, a web server, and that web server uh, errored out. There was a memory leak, or that instance had an issue, and you know it 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 crashed, or your data center <laughs> had connectivity issues. Where I'm making a request, your your servers are working just fine, health systems are great, but when I'm making a request, it does not reach um, you know the data center. So, what what would you do in these scenarios. If your servers were working fine, um, you can always set up a custom error message. I think customizing uh, error messages from your own server is, is always been straightforward and can be handled seamlessly. But if it's an infrastructure problem, and the problem is with your infrastructure, which is serving the content, that infrastructure cannot you know, uh, handle the availability and failover in a you know, consistent manner, simply because it's not reachable. Uh, so. As an end user, when I go to the Haspeak site, and if uh, the data center itself was down or the Nginx server was having issues, uh, I would get no response. And if uh, Zenab decides, you know, I, I don't want the Chrome's default uh, error message, which is a connection timeout to show up, um, I want a fancy message. And we've seen a lot of these in the past. Uh, we've seen uh, the fail whale, the magical unicorns for, uh, GitHub, um, we've seen the Rusty break for Google. Some of these are, uh, you know, the error messages which tell you that, okay, you know what, things have gone wrong, um, and and that happens. But we are looking at it, and we'll be back up. So yeah. um, that's important, uh, both from a branding perspective and to give your, you know, end users some assurance. If it's a business uh, that's that's critical for your end users, uh, you just want to give them the feeling that. It's important you're looking at it, and there are other ways to contact you. You can put in either a Twitter handle or an email uh, address for them to reach out if the site is not available. Um, CDNs can also similarly handle automatic failover to another data center. Almost all CDNs have some capability to do that. Yeah. Um, and finally, when it comes to security. Now, <laughs> security, again, it's, it's best handled uh, you know, in a distributed manner. Uh, if uh, you know, I think I didn't put an uh, image here, but uh, if you go back to uh, the original uh, distributed setup that I was talking about, CDNs have multiple points of presence, and each of them can uh, you know cater to the demands that's coming in locally. Similarly, if there are malicious requests or uh, you know uh, attacks against your site, it's handled in a distributed manner. Or at least in almost all cases, it's handled outside the perimeter of your data center. Um, that that ensures that at least you know the, you don't have to deal with the bad traffic. Um, in addition to the regular traffic that that you're already catering to. In almost all cases, whether it's a static site or whether you have uh, you know some logic running, it's it's going to take up some compute. You have uh, DB lookups and, and other things going on. You don't want all of these malicious requests to you know uh, add to that particular server load. Yeah. So security again is is something CDNs do fairly well, and um, the CDN capabilities have actually you know kept increasing over the years. So we've gone over caching and delivering static content, uh, proxying dynamic content, and content acceleration, web security. Additionally, a lot of CDNs do video streaming, image optimizations, and edge compute. Edge compute is, um, you know, again, an emerging trend. Uh, we're all used to AWS and, and uh, the big cloud providers providing some compute capabilities or even serverless capabilities. Um, those compute, those capabilities are slowly trickling down, um, you know, to the CDNs as well. But it makes a lot of sense. Similar to how you bring content, if you can bring compute closer to the end user, it just makes it more distributed, more faster, you can respond uh, much quicker. So that would be great if you can explain each of the terms very briefly, not in much, and I mean, in the interest of time, not in much detail, but uh, uh, some of these terms like proxy dynamic content might be a little difficult to understand. Yeah, yeah. So um, proxy dynamic content, it's actually, you know, it, it, it means exactly what we went through in the use case. We said, okay, uh, Haskey, 
the home page for Haskeek is a dynamic dynamic content, but I want to deliver that through a CDN. Uh, what I want the CDN to do is accept the request, but not cache the page. Go back to the uh, data center, fetch the right resource, and deliver it back to the end user. So in that situation, um, a CDN is acting like a proxy for your uh, your service or your server, and essentially that's 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 what it means and by virtue of being a proxy it's able to accelerate content as well that is um, you know by reducing the rtts being closer to the end user reusing some tcp uh, connections um, different cdns use different techniques but at the end of the day um, there is an element of acceleration uh, that's provided same goes for web security now there are different capabilities now web security is very complex um, different providers and vendors have different capabilities. Um, at a high level, you have two major threat categories, and I'm not being comprehensive at all. I'm probably touching on two that, that comes on top of my head. Uh, it's DDoS protection and uh, attacks against your application or application layer attacks. Um, you use a web application firewall to protect against that uh, the, the application layer attacks. and <clears throat> Um, you use the entire CDN platform to sort of protect you against DDoS attacks. Um, both of these are, you know, fairly um, detailed topics. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's good. that's good. Video streaming again is um, is a problem of delivery at scale. Uh, video content is heavier than your images CSS. So uh, you there is no way you can deliver all the videos from a single location. You would have to use a delivery network to um, stream videos, whether it's live streaming or on-demand content. Um, you're more or less uh, relying on uh, CDNs to handle that workload for you. Right. Now, image optimizations is uh, an interesting one. Now, um, you know, until I think um, Safari is um, in tech preview or beta of uh, supporting WebP. And once that supports, maybe across all browsers, we have generic support for WebP. But as it stands today, different uh, browsers have different uh, image formats that are optimized. Chrome is a big proponent of WebP. And those uh, that WebP as a format is uh, more compressed than your JPEGs and your PNGs. And that essentially reduces the amount of bytes that needs to be transferred. And that sort of uh, makes it uh, uh, more optimal and by virtue of being more optimal, yeah. uh, more performant. We, we had also covered the entire image optimization as a topic in one of our sessions. Uh, okay, so perfect. Something that we have discussed in great detail so far. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, then there's finally edge compute. Edge compute, um, you know, it's um, uh, there, there are a lot of capabilities that uh, CDNs are providing. Um, at a high level, you can think of some or all of Lambda-like capabilities being available on uh, different CDNs. Um, the advantage is uh, it's it's um, you know no, it's it's more distributed than uh, uh, big cloud providers. Okay, um, I I, I want to I know I'm probably a little short on time, so I want to get through this really quickly. Now, yes, please. Um, if you want to set up a CDN for your site. Um, it's actually fairly easy to do it today. Um, you just need to take care of two things. One is you need to have control over your DNS and domain. What that means is um, if Zenob wants to set up a CDN for haskeek.com, um, now haskeek.com uses Route 53 as a domain name registrar. So I would need access to the Route 53 portal. Um, I would also need access to or control over the server that's uh, currently delivering haskeek.com site. Um, that's, uh, you know, we know that it's running on E2E network and it's an Nginx server. So if I have access to that, it's great. Once you have these two things, um, all you need to do is a CDN config. Uh, you need to set up a CDN config. Almost all, all CDNs uh, provide a portal and a UI to set this up. And different vendors have different capabilities. You can um, today, in almost all cases, use an API to set them up as well. And once you've set up the CDN config, um, you're likely going to have to make a DNS change. Now we spoke about uh, the C name that that points to uh, the CDN. So 
as a final step, you'll you'll point uh, your site to uh, the CDN C name, and and from that point on, uh, your sites are getting delivered through a CDN. So, um, what are the different options that you have as CDN? Um, there's Akamai. I, I, before I get to the different options, um, there are generally two classes of CDN, right? One of them is a general purpose CDN, which basically means that they cache all of your content, they'll proxy your entire site APIs or uh, services, and they are able to deliver it. And you're most likely going to use them in your commercial projects or uh, you know, your personal blogs and, and uh, sites like that. Um, there's another class of CDNs, which is uh, specifically catering to the requirements of free and open source projects. So if you have a free and open source project that's hosted out of GitHub, you would choose from one of these CDN options. Um, they work really well. So quickly over uh, to the general purpose CDN. So there are a bunch of them available. All of them have um, you know, the three basic capabilities that we spoke about. That is, um, there is a performance element, a security element to it. And all of them offer some uh, improved reliability for your sites. So you would most likely be picking from one of these options here. And if you have an open source project, uh, and, and I want to make that distinction a little clear, you would be using one of these free CDNs that's specifically catering to open source projects. But <clears throat> what you deliver over the CDN and how it's delivered slightly differs from uh, the workflow that we spoke about. And uh, um, essentially, um, in, in all of these CDNs, uh, the goal is to deliver your libraries, your open source libraries in most cases, to other websites, not particularly your site, to other websites, um, you know, in a fast and efficient and a reliable manner. So that's that's generally the the use of these CDNs. You've seen, um, you know, a lot of these. A good example is, uh, you know, jQuery hosted on, uh, you know, the Google uh, CDN, and um, it's actually hosted in, in multiple different places. It's it's a very popular library. Now, some of these uh, open source CDNs, um, you you cannot uh, choose to opt in. Um, you might have to get elected, or you might have to reach a certain popularity before it gets published on these CDNs. But that's essentially the the nature of how they operate, but these options are definitely just there. want to step in over here. But to our audience, the reverse use case might be useful, which is not that you're hosting C, uh, open source project, but if you're using an open source project, then you might yeah. want to tap onto these CDNs rather than uh, hosting it yourself. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, you know, um, in 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 a lot of cases, if you're not using a CDN, um, there's a lot of benefit in at least uh, getting all your JavaScript and your fonts from one of um, you know the, the, the hosted CDNs that, that cater to those specific libraries. But if you're using a CDN of your own, um, there are different benefits to getting them delivered through your infrastructure. Your own and, CDN, yeah. yeah. Um, it primarily is to just use the connections that have already been set up and um, in almost all cases, uh, the general purpose CDNs have a larger spread compared to some of these CDNs. Right. Okay, so you know uh, there are a bunch of different CDNs. How do you go about selecting one that's that's right for you? Um, there are three goals um, that you might have, um, and and that's essentially common across all CDNs: security, performance, and offload. Um, one, the first thing you need to do is figure out what's relevant to you. Once you've uh, figured out what's relevant, um, you can go you can go ahead and figure out, okay, what are these different CDNs? What capabilities do they have? And is there a specific capability that that really is important to me? Um, if there is a differentiating capability, then it's a slam dunk. Just go ahead and um, you know use it. If you have just one CDN having that capability, um, if um, you know capabilities are fairly similar, um, you want to figure out which of them is good for the performance of my site. You have to run a benchmarking exercise in most cases. Uh, and you know, my recommendation for running benchmark is don't use web page test as a mechanism to benchmark, simply because they are point in time tests. Um, they don't accurately represent you know, uh, the capabilities of the CDN, simply because 
internet is um, fairly chaotic you might not get consistent results and it doesn't really matter how many times you run these uh, web web page tests it does not accurately represent how your users are going to see the performance of your site right the easy thing to do is use uh, rum data now rum data uh, is your user um, performance metrics that's collected from the browser there are tools that you're probably already using uh, like google analytics boomerang uh, impulse there are a lot of vendors which provide uh, capability around real user monitoring uh, so use real user monitoring data as a you know simple way to figure out what is the performance of all of these different options um, in the real world and how are my users uh, how are your users being impacted positively negatively uh, by using some of these options and right. that uh, pretty much brings to uh, uh, most of what i wanted to talk about there are some useful uh, tools um, so i think you've gone through some of these already so i'll just keep it brief um, in most of my uh, conversations i tend to use google lighthouse uh, and web page test a lot um, yeah. if i want to understand the latest trends um, on specifically about how websites are built uh, the http archive is a great resource um akamai puts out a state of the internet report that you know talks about a general internet overview and security trends across the internet so that's a good resource again to get some information on what are some of the recent trends uh, in both internet space and security space